Record prices, price rises in petrol. I know you're a seasoned campaigner against price rises, but uh, the Chancellor's going ahead with it this time, isn't he? Yes, well, we have to wait and see. It's the number one issue facing our country. In, in my constituency, it's costing a tenth of the average motorist uh, their, their income, the amount of money they're paying on petrol prices every year. And I was glad the government cut fuel duty last year and didn't uh, go ahead with the planned January increase. We're urging with Fair Fuel UK the government to postpone the August uh, increase and also to cut fuel tax as soon as fin financial conditions allow. Gavin Chuka, let's talk about the Labour position on this because I understand Labour was keen on this fuel price escalator which uh, automatically increased prices ahead of inflation, sold as a, a, a green benefit but actually just a, another tax on the motorist. I think if the economy were growing we'd be in a different place but we actually accept the best way that you can get growth in the economy and reduce fuel costs is VAT. Uh, that's adding two, three quid onto the average fill up at the tanks. And that's actually a really important thing that we could do right now, and George Osborne should do. There's a fuel protest, Robert Halfham, planned in London on Wednesday, but this whole thing hasn't gained the momentum that it did this time last year, has it? Uh, well, it has, I mean, and there are still thousands of people who've signed the petition. The problem with a VAT cut, and whilst everyone would welcome a VAT cut, not only does it cost 12 billion pounds and would increase our mortgages because increased borrowing, but businesses don't pay VAT, so they wouldn't benefit from uh, any fuel price okay. reduction. All right, thank you very much. Now, staying with frustrated motorists, here in the East, road improvements are always near the top of the agenda. Well, this week, ministers have agreed to sit down with MPs to discuss how to upgrade the A47 from Great Yarmouth to Peterborough. Robert Halfen, if we have a toll road, the already hard-pressed motorists will just have to pay even more money to go about their daily business. Well, it's good news that the government are investing 130 million in this new road, but it was impossible to, given the economic situation we were in, to fully fund the billion pounds roughly that it would cost. So we have to look at alternative methods. The toll road works very well for the M6 in the north of England, and I think we should go more, further and faster looking at toll roads, because if we want these roads, we have to fund them from somehow, and money doesn't grow on trees. We're are facing a very difficult but how economic time. how can people afford to utilise a, a road like that? It's an, it's an expensive way to go, isn't it? It is, yes, but at least people have the option and the uh, M6 toll road has been incredibly successful. Um, Gavin Shuka, don't you feel that we're being very stuck in the mud about continuing with the amount of traffic on our roads? What about this idea that was mooted at the end of that film about simply getting the freight off? Well, I think it's a great point. And across the east of England, we know we need further and greater investment in public transport as well as road transport as well. The key thing, though, on the M6 toll road is that you've got a choice. For many people living across uh, East Anglia, uh, the A14 is not another choice that they can choose to access. It's their only route. And they suffer really badly from delays. Robert Which Halfen? Is why the government are investing 130 million. But we have to recognise that the economic situation we're in, money doesn't grow on trees. And we have to make judgments uh, about where money is spent. In my own area, we're looking for an extra junction, an extra junction 7A on the M11. That's going to cost 15 million. What about pounds. Europe? I know you're a Eurosceptic, but Europe could be the saviour of all these problems, couldn't it? <laughs> well, of course, if European money is available for, uh, for this scheme, all well and good. And uh, I would support the government doing everything it can to try and get European funding but let's let's wait and see to see if they're ready and waiting to give us the money. I mean let me give you an example from my own constituency this government have been good in approving the junction 10A from the M1 expansion plans that means we can move more and new businesses to Luton and they can get their goods to market it helps everyone I don't accept the argument that there's no money for improvements and the Chancellor, interestingly, doesn't either. They want to put more money into priority we're, capital. We're investment. not saying no money. We've invested, uh, we're going to invest 130 million. So you put that money in and you get a serious amount of Gavin return. Gavin Chica, wasn't it Labour that actually downgraded the A47 in the first place? Well, we, we took a view across the whole of the Eastern region that you needed to put the money where you could get the best sense of return. Now, that was in a time of growth. In a time of deficit, I think the argument becomes even more sharp. Um, we know that for every pound you put in, you get three or four pounds out on these major improvement projects. So we need to have that okay. kind of long-term vision on I it. I want to talk about another form of, of transport now. So let's look at the case for a new Ireland airport in the Thames estuary. The Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, has championed the idea. Uh, Gavin Shuka, the government due to launch its sustainable framework for aviation later this month. Labour had a, a chance to, to expand airports with a white paper, um, recommended new runways. Why didn't this all happen years ago? Well, I, 
personally think it's a real shame that we're not building that third runway at Heathrow because I believe there is a real aviation capacity crunch coming our way. And uh, once we've uh, looked at China as the example where they're developing a new green economy, we can also look at them and realise they're building 100 new airports to get that technology into the hands of countries in the rest of the world. That's part of how we build a new green economy. But they're starting from no airports. We're starting from having airports back into the 1920s. They're just modernising their economy now. So making that kind of comparison, I mean, they're playing catch-up. They're not putting stuff on top of what they already you have. Can, you can see very, very clearly that there is a big capacity issue. Now, coming to Boris Island, I don't believe it's going to happen. It's a convenient wheeze for the coalition because they can say they've got an aviation well, strategy and it's a convenient wheeze for Boris out, as well. Let's find out in your words if it is a convenient wheeze because even within the coalition there's a, a lot of opposition, isn't there? let alone the local people that we mentioned. Of course, there's always opposition to anything new that is proposed. But let's face the facts. Uh, uh, you know, my idea of torture is going to Heathrow Airport. It's desperately in need of modernisation. Mm. And uh, <laughs> we have to have maybe have some vision for a chance and, and look at whether this Boris Island might be a good idea. I'm moderately sympathetic to it. I don't know yet where I'd like to see the economic and the environmental impact uh, uh, consultation once that comes through. But we need to look at new options because Heathrow, I believe, has had its stay. Uh, Tony Juniper, there's always been opposition to major projects. Let's talk about the, the Victorians. We can't have any railways. They would ruin the environment. Surely we should, we should you know, move with the time, shouldn't we? And the times are of a shrinking planet in ecological terms. Climate change is starting to get to the point where now the scientists are warning of a catastrophe later this century. We're getting to the point where a mass extinction of animals and plants is underway. And I think if we're going to get with the times, we have to start recognising some of these major environmental problems and start playing some kind of a role in solving them as if the future actually mattered. And I think the short-termism of our politicians when it comes to these issues is really quite breathtaking. The scientists at the heart of government are signing letters saying that we have an unprecedented emergency on our hands when it comes to the climate issue and the loss of animals and plants. And here we are, building an airport in the middle of a wildlife haven that will make massive carbon dioxide emissions. It makes no sense. If we're going to get with the times, let's build a clean and green Just economy. Very That's briefly, the way very forward. briefly. Gavin Shuka, what about expansion at Luton? What do you think about that? Well, I've welcomed the plans to expand Luton up to 18 million passengers over a period of time. We think we can make a contribution to this capacity crunch that's coming using the infrastructure that's there without building additional runway space, for example. But it doesn't solve our problems about a hub airport. We do need a serious hub that doesn't fall over every time it rains or snows. Okay, we'll leave it there, gentlemen. Tony Juniper, thank you very much for joining us today.